Okay, um, now we're going to move into anatomy and physiology. Um, you know, if you've not taken a uh, AMP course uh, or have had anatomy and physiology in high school, um, this, like medical terminology, um, is something that uh, you just acquire over time. Uh, it's always a good idea that, uh, just like with medical terminology, that we understand um, not only all the parts of the body, but uh, to a simpler degree, how those uh, parts all work together. So uh, we're going to start right in with the uh, musculoskeletal system as part of our anatomy and the whole purpose of musculoskeletal uh, by virtue of the word. Uh, we're referring to the muscles and the bones. And the muscles and the bones have three main functions. They give your body shape. Uh, they protect your vital internal organs. Uh, and muscles provide movement of the body. The skeleton itself, uh, you have just enough bones, I think 206, uh, just enough bones to make a complete skeleton. Uh, it consists of the skull, the spine, the ribs, and the sternum, the shoulders, the upper extremities, the pelvis, uh, and the lower extremities. Now, when we look at the skull, the skull is made up of four bones, four pair of bones. Uh, and at birth, those bones are not fused together. Uh, so there are what you're familiar with as soft spots in the skulls of babies. Uh, they're known as fontanelles. Um, and as we grow, you can see those suture lines um, that are being referenced here. These suture lines uh, is where these bones eventually do uh, grow together. So when we look at the skull, the skull is made up of four pair of fused bones in the adult patient. Uh, you've got two frontal bones, a left and right frontal bone. You have two parietal bones. Uh, you have two temporal bones, and you have two occipital bones. And they form an inflexible box that does not give, and it has one natural hole in the base of the skull that we can't see in this diagram, known as the foramen magnum. Uh, which is Latin for big hole. And that's where the spinal cord comes up and becomes the brain stem. And then the face uh, is attached to the uh, a skull as well. Uh, this, the face is made up of multiple bones to include the uh, sphenoid bone, uh, the nasal bone, uh, the lacrimal bone, the orbit, where the eye sits, uh, the maxilla, which is your upper jaw, and your mandible, which is your lower jaw, uh, and then your uh, zygomatic bones, which are your cheeks. Um, and that makes up your face and skull. Now, the spinal column is 33 vertebrae. Uh, the spinal column is essential for movement. Out of each vertebrae comes two motor nerves and two sensory nerves um, uh, going to all parts of the body. Uh, so the sensory nerves will um, relay uh, things like hot, cold, pressure, pain, pleasure, uh, back to the brainstem, and then the motor nerves uh, will elicit a motor response. Um, the thorax, or the chest, contains the heart, the lungs, and the eight great vessels. The ribs that make up the thorax, along with the spinal column, uh, help protect the heart, the lungs, and the major blood vessels. So here is a... Um, uh, a diagram of the uh, spinal column. Uh, each one of those vertebrae stack one on top of each other. Uh, there is a disc in between each of those. You, know, you may hear of people who herniate a disc, and that's that little soft cartilage that acts as a cushion between the bones um, uh, of the uh, spinal column. Um, you have seven cervical vertebrae, you have 12 thoracic vertebrae uh, that correspond to the 12 ribs, you have five lumbar vertebrae, uh, and then you have uh, the a sacrum and the coccyx. The sacrum uh, are vertebrae that are fused together as well as the coccyx or the tailbone, uh, which is fused together uh, as well. Now the spinal 
cord uh, does not run down all the way to the sacrum. Uh, it exits at the lumbar region uh, into a big fan of nerves known as the caudal equina uh, that um, services the pelvis and the lower extremities. The pelvis bones include the ilium, the ischium, the pubis, and the hip joint. And the hip joint is made up of the acetabulum and the ball uh, at the proximal end of the uh, femur. Uh, so when somebody breaks their hip or fractures their hip, they don't actually break their pelvis per se. They usually just snap that ball off the end of the femur. The lower extremities include the femur then, which is the largest bone in your body, uh, the patella, which is your kneecap, and then the tibia and the fibula are the two bones of your lower leg, uh, as well as your ankle. And then you have uh, a lateral malleolus, which is the outside of your ankle. And the medial malleolus is the bump that you fill on the inside or the side of your big toe. Your foot is made up of your metatarsals, uh, your heel, uh, and your uh, phalanges, which are your toe bones. Your upper extremities include your clavicles, uh, your scapula or shoulder blades. Your acromion process is what makes up your, which is part of uh, your uh, shoulder. Uh, the acromion process, along with the clavicle and the scapula, and the head of the humerus, uh, makes up your shoulder joint. Uh, your radius and ulna are the two bones of your lower arm. You have your wrist with multiple bones, and the long bones in your hand are your uh uh, the wrist bones are your carpals. The long bones in your hand are called metacarpals. And then the uh, bones of your fingers are called phalanges. And here is just a, uh, a diagram identifying all those bones that we just uh, spoke of. So it's important to, um, you know, learn what these bones are called because, you know, if you're talking about a femur fracture or somebody tells you they had a, uh, a medial malleolus uh, compound fracture, uh, you'd know exactly what part of the body they were talking about and where it would uh, be located. Now, joints are formed when bones c connect to one another, and there are two types of joints, basically two types of joints, uh, ball and socket which is what we see in the uh, shoulder, which is what we see in the hip, uh, and then hinge joints is what we see in the fingers. Now, muscles, uh, there are three types of muscles. There is skeletal muscle, uh, there is cardiac muscle, and there is smooth muscle. Now, skeletal muscle is also known as striated muscle just because of how it looks under a microscope. Uh, skeletal muscle is under voluntary control. In other words, I can command skeletal muscle to move. Um, if you move your arm, if you move your legs, uh, any muscle that you command to move uh, is skeletal muscle. Smooth muscle is what your arteries are made up of. Uh, and smooth muscles are under uh autonomic control. Think of it as automatic control. Uh, smooth muscles are found in your stomach, they're found in your intestine, they're found in your arteries. We don't have to uh, uh, consciously think about constricting or dilating our blood vessels in order to maintain blood pressure. We don't have to constantly think about moving and propelling food from our mouth uh, through our whole GI tract. It's just something that automatically occurs. Cardiac muscle is extremely unique muscle, and we'll talk more about that in the cardiac section of the program. Uh, cardiac muscle refers specifically to a unique tissue uh, found in the heart that has some very unique properties that we'll, again, talk about in that portion of the uh, class. Now, the purpose of the respiratory system is to bring in oxygen when we inhale but then also to get rid of carbon dioxide when we exhale. Now, air enters the body through the mouth and nose where it is warmed and humidified and filtered, and it moves down into the back of the throat, 
and then towards the lungs. It passes by the epiglottis, which is a little leaf-shaped muscle that closes over the glottic opening, which is the opening to your trachea. Uh, the epiglottis uh, can become inflamed, as we'll learn. Uh, uh, epi means above. Um, glottis is that leaf-shaped muscle above uh, the trachea that slam shut when you swallow so you don't get water down into your lungs or food down into your lungs. Um, a little important uh, feature that we need to know. The larynx is your voice box and that's where your vocal cords are. They're in your larynx. Uh, in men it's more predominantly seen because uh, a male may have a very predominant Adam's apple uh, and that's where the larynx is. Uh, the cricoid cricord cartilage forms the lower portion of uh, the larynx and that's important more as a ALS person because uh, we can do a cricoid thyrotomy, uh, needle cricothyrotomy uh, in somebody who has a complete airway obstruction. Now the trachea is your windpipe uh, it extends down from the glottic opening to an area known as the carina and the trachea divides into a left and right main stem bronchi and the bronchi divide uh, into smaller bronchioles uh, and the bronchioles divide into terminal bronchioles that are surrounded by air sacs called alveoli. Uh, the diaphragm is a very important part of the respiratory system as well. The diaphragm uh, contracts and flattens. Uh, the intercostal muscles contract. That makes your chest large uh, and much like a billows. As your chest becomes large, the pressure inside your chest becomes less than what's out in the room and air rushes in to fill that space. So all those things we just talked about are displayed here in this particular dia diagram uh, as well. Um, you can see the trachea dividing into a left and right main stem. That's at the area of the carina. And you can see the uh, terminal bronchioles, uh, all those little hair-like, uh, all those little... Uh, air passages, and those are surrounded by lung tissue, which is uh, alveoli. Now, you have lobes of your lungs as well. You've got three lobes on the left, or excuse me, three lobes on the right and two lobes on the left. Uh, functionally, the reason we only have two lobes on the left is that the heart primarily occupies a big space over there as well on the left, so there's no room for a third lobe. Now, inhalation is an active process, and what we mean by an active process is that inhalation requires energy, um, and so we have to have energy to breathe. If we don't have energy, if we don't have the, the necessary uh, sugar and oxygen and things to, to produce energy, if we don't have that energy... Uh, it's very difficult to breathe. And if we get into a situation where we're breathing really hard and really fast because we have a medical condition like asthma or pneumonia or something like that, um, we actually can burn up all our energy and quit breathing because we just have no more energy to inhale. Uh, now, during inhalation, this active process, the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles contract. Uh, the diaphragm goes down, the ribs pull the chest up and outward, and that negative pressure allows air to, to, to go into the lungs. Gas exchange takes place, <clears throat> and then on exhalation, the weight of the chest uh, and the uh, diaphragm returns to its normal position, and the weight of the chest uh, forces the air out of the lungs. Now, ventilation is the term that we use to describe the movement of gases to and from the lungs or to and from the air sacs. Now, you have 700 million alveoli, and they're not all full of air all the time. Uh, as we sit and we rest, uh, alveoli collapse, uh, and they stick together when they collapse. And the collapsing of alveoli from lack of air movement uh, is known as atelectasis. Well, obviously, if alveoli are collapsed, 
they can't play in gas exchange. And if enough of the alveoli collapse, you get a large portion of the lung that isn't functional. And so what your body will do is you'll either yawn uh, or you'll sigh. Now, a sigh is not unrelinquished love. Uh, It is uh, your body telling you, you need to take a deep breath and open up those alveoli that have collapsed. Now, respiration is the exchange of gases between the cells and the bloodstream. Uh, So respiration is out at the cellular end. Ventilation is just getting air in to your lungs so the gas exchange can take place. Now oxygenated blood is carried from the lungs to the heart and then it's pumped to the rest of the body. Um, At the cellular level, oxygen is exchanged with cells for waste Uh, cellular waste and carbon dioxide and then that deoxygenated blood returns in veins to the right side of the heart the right side of the heart pumps that deoxygenated blood to the lungs gas exchange takes place in the lungs and then that freshly oxygenated blood is pumped from the lungs to the left side of the heart where the left side of the heart pumps that blood to all parts of the body so that it can get to the cells and the oxygen can come off and the carbon dioxide can be picked up. Now, something to keep in mind, we talked about the anatomy of of the upper airway, the tongue and the jaw and the, uh, uh, the nasopharynx and the oropharynx and the epiglottis, those sort of things. Um... Children have slightly different anatomy that uh, can lead to respiratory compromise that we should be aware of. Uh, One is that their tongue is much larger and their mouth is much smaller. As a result, their tongue is a more common form of airway obstruction when they're unconscious, lying flat on their back. Um, The child's trachea is narrower and shorter, so it's more easily obstructed with fluid or a foreign body. Um, the cartilage in their neck is uh, in their trachea is less rigid and less developed, so it's softer. And when a child works really hard to breathe, they can actually collapse their trachea as they're inhaling uh, uh, very hard. It's the cartilage bands of the trachea that keep it um, open when we do breathe. Otherwise, the trachea would collapse without those cartilage bands. Uh, In any event, all those things, the larger tongue, the smaller mouth, the shorter trachea, the narrower trachea, uh, make the child more prone to airway obstruction if they're unconscious lying flat on their back. The other thing to keep in mind is that uh, their occiput, the back part of their head, can be very large, uh, causing the child to tilt forward. Uh, So they can hyperflex uh, when they uh, lie flat, which also will cause an airway obstruction. The cardiovascular system is made up of the heart, the blood, and the blood vessels. The heart is a four-chambered, electrically driven muscular pump. The four chambers of the heart include two atria, a left and right atria, and two ventricles, a left and right ventricles. So you have the right side of the heart, and you have the left side of your heart. The right side of your heart pumps blood to the lungs for oxygenation, and the left side of your heart pumps freshly oxygenated blood to all parts of your body. So here is the the, uh, anatomy of the heart uh, with uh, the uh, direction and flow of blood being identified uh, by the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And it's important here that as an EMT, you understand how blood flows through the heart uh, and uh, what happens when that pump doesn't work right. So as an example, if um, if I understand that all blood comes to the heart from the superior, the superior and the inferior vena cava, these two large veins dump the blood into the right atrium. Blood flows from the right atrium through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. When the right ventricle contracts, it pumps that unoxygenated blood 
through the pulmonary arteries. Now, this is the only part in your body where unoxygenated blood travels in an artery. Once the blood is oxygenated at the lungs, it comes back from the lungs through the pulmonary veins. In the pulmonary veins, this is the only vein in the body where freshly oxygenated blood is carried. The pulmonary vein dumps the blood into the left atrium, where it then goes through the mitral valve into the left ventricle, and then the left ventricle pumps it out the aorta to all parts of the body. So it's important, again, as an EMT that you understand the flow of blood. If the right side of the heart fails, which it can from heart disease, heart attack, that sort of stuff, blood is going to back up through the superior inferior vena cava, causing jugular vein distension, swollen ankles, enlarged liver, those sort of things. If the left side of the heart fails, which it can from congestive failure or heart attack, blood's going to back up into the lungs, causing acute pulmonary edema or fluid bubbling inside the lungs, which is going to impede the gas exchange. Now, the heart, as I had mentioned, is an electrically driven muscular pump. And the primary pacemaker in your heart is the sinoatrial node. Uh, it normally fires or discharges an electrical spark uh, at a rate of uh, 60 to 100. Um, when it discharges, the electricity travels through the internodal pathways causing both atrium to contract at the same time. The electricity ends up here at the atrioventricular node, which is the gatekeeper to the ventricles. It's going to hold that electricity for a split second, no more than two-tenths of one second, and then let that electric electricity go down the uh, bundle of hiss, where it then goes down the right and left bundle branch through the Purkinje system. And as the electricity travels through the Purkinje system, both ventricles contract. So you have a spark. The electricity travels from cell to cell to cell. Both atrium contract. They fill the ventricles full of blood when they contract. And then when the timing is right and the electricity flows, through the ventricles, both ventricles contract, pumping blood to all parts of the body through the left ventricle, pumping blood to the lungs from the right ventricle. It's organized, it's coordinated, it moves blood from your fifth week of conception until you die. There are some arteries that you should know as well when it comes to circulating blood. Arteries carry freshly oxygenated blood with the exception of the pulmonary artery. You have coronary arteries. Coronary arteries are arteries that are on the outside of the heart. The coronary arteries supply blood to the coronary, to the heart. The coronary arteries supply blood to the heart. Uh, heart tissue, the heart muscle. Uh, that's where that muscle gets its uh, energy and um, uh, nutrients. <coughs> um, the coronary arteries come right off the aorta. The aorta is the largest vessel in the body. Uh, it carries your freshly oxygenated blood uh, and divides uh, quite quickly into other major arteries, your carotid arteries in your neck, uh, your femoral arteries in your legs, um, Typically, when we obtain pulses, uh, we're finding an artery uh, and palpating or pushing that artery against a bone so that we can feel the, feel the pulsing of the blood uh, as the heart beats. Uh, so we'll look at obtaining pulses through the carotid artery, which you do in CPR, as well as a femoral artery in the leg, uh, brachial artery in children, uh, when you're or infants, when you're trying to determine the need for CPR, and then the radial artery when checking pulses in uh, patients as well. <clears throat> the posterior tibial artery um, 
is uh, on the back side uh, of the leg, and the dorsalis pedis uh, artery uh, is on the foot. Now, what is in blood that makes it so important? Uh, well, the vast majority of blood is made up of plasma. Uh, plasma is the transporting medium uh, that carries uh, the blood cells to all parts of your body. Um, the cells in your blood include red blood cells. They're known as RBCs or erythrocytes. Cytes means cell. Erythro means red. Um, they're also called red corpuscles um, in older texts. Uh, <coughs> we typically just refer to them as RBCs. Red blood cells carry oxygen. They have the hemoglobin molecule on the red cell that has an affinity to attract oxygen. So we need red cells to carry oxygen to all parts of our body. People who lack red cells are called anemic uh, white blood cells, or WBCs, are leukocytes. Again, cytes means cell. Leuco means white. Uh, they're also called white corpuscles in older circles. Um, what we typically refer to them as WBCs. Now, WBCs, there are five types of white blood cells, and they are uh, available in your body to help fight infection. And depending upon which one of the five is uh, most present, uh, uh, they can determine at what point of the infection you are. Um, uh, early in the infection, uh, certain white cells are more prevalent. Later in the infection, other white cells are more prevalent. <clears throat> so they'll do a, a white count. They'll look to see what your white count is and identify those cells and, and how many are present. Platelets are responsible to uh, help you clot. Uh, if we look at red cells or white cells under a microscope, they're round. And as those cells get together, as they accumulate or um, aggregate together, uh, they just roll off each other. Uh, with um, platelets, those cells have fingers. They're very irregularly shaped cells. And when they get together, they have a tendency to lock up and help form a clot. Uh, the pulse is a pressure wave of blood flowing down an artery when the left ventricle contracts, pumping blood to all parts of the body. And again, we can feel the pulse when we compress an artery over a bone. The most common pulses that we're going to check are the uh, actually the uh, carotid in the neck or the radial in the wrist. Uh, the brachial is on the inside of the arm. Again, the posterior tibial is behind the leg and the dorsalis pedis is on top of the foot. Um, and the um, femoral artery uh, is located uh, in the groin. Now, pulses near the center of the body are called central pulses. They include the carotid and femoral pulses. Uh, peripheral pulses are pulses that are out in the periphery, away from the central or core part of the body. The force of blood exerted against the wall of the vessel is known as the blood pressure, and we measure it in a top number and a bottom number. The top number is the systolic pressure, and that's the pressure in the arteries when that left ventricle contracts. Uh, the bottom number of your blood pressure is known as diastolic, and that's the pressure when the left ventricle uh, refills. But more importantly, the diastolic number is the pressure in the arteries all the time. And the higher that diastolic is, the more pressure is exerted against the walls of your artery, and the harder your left ventricle has to work to pump blood to all parts of your body. So we're real concerned about that bottom number. Perfusion uh, refers to adequate circulation of blood for the exchange of oxygen and waste products. So adequate perfusion means that freshly oxygenated blood flows to an organ, through an organ, and exits oxygen poor and full of waste. Hypoperfusion is the term that we give for shock. Hypo, not enough, perfusion, not enough blood flow to your tissues. So when blood flow becomes inadequate, it's known as hypoperfusion or shock. And there's a variety of different types of shock that we'll discuss later. 
<clears throat> now, the cardiopulmonary system uh, refers to the heart and the lungs. Uh, these two systems must work together uh, in order for perfusion to occur. We have to be able to get oxygen uh, into our bloodstream. We have to be able to pump or move that blood, that oxygenated blood, to all parts of our body. And then we have to be able to get that carbon dioxide back to the lungs where it can be expelled with exhalation. So anything that affects the function of the lungs, anything that affects the function of the heart, anything that affects the uh, onloading of oxygen into the blood or the offloading of oxygen at the cells uh, is going to lead to um, shock. The lymphatic system uh, is a, a drain system that captures fluid. The lymphatic system helps us maintain our balance of fluid as well. Um, the lymphatic system includes uh, these lymphoid organs, um, your tonsils and adenoids. Many people uh, don't have their tonsils and adenoids anymore. They were removed at an early age or removed as a result of uh, chronic uh, throat, um, strep throat or uh, sore throats or infections of the throat. Uh, your spleen is a lymphoid organ. Uh, your thymus, located in the neck, uh, is a lymphoid organ, and then you have lymph nodes uh, under your arms and in your groin. Uh, when somebody has had a uh, had their lymph nodes removed uh, as part of a treatment for cancer, uh, it's important that we don't take uh, a blood pressure on the side of the body uh, where the lymph nodes have been removed. Now here they're just referring to a woman who's had a mastectomy because typically when they have a mastectomy and they remove the breast, they also remove the lymph nodes un under that uh, arm. Uh, and um, do, giving a blood pressure in that arm, squeezing that arm, backing the fluid up into the system um, could cause a uh, swelling of the extremity later. The nervous system is made up of the brain and the uh, spinal cord, as well as the peripheral nerves, which include sensation, uh, sensory nerves, motor nerves, but it also includes a very important uh, system known as the autonomic nervous system, which is made up of the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. Okay. The... Okay, my apologies. The uh, slide presentation, the lecture just cut off uh, unknown to me at this uh, point uh, when we were discussing the nervous system. So I'll uh, pick it up here. Um, the nervous system is made up of the, um, the brain and the uh, spinal cord. Uh, as well as the uh, sensory nerves and the motor nerves, as well as the autonomic nervous system. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, those here. Uh, the central nervous system, of course, is the brain and the spinal cord, and that's the, um, the main part of the uh, nervous system. The peripheral nervous system, out here in the periphery, out here in your arms and legs and chest, away from the brain and the spinal cord, are your sensory nerves and your motor nerves. Your sensory nerves... Um, uh, take sensory information, hot, cold, pleasure, pressure, pain, and relay that information back to the brain where a motor response is uh, sent through the motor nerves. So if you hold your finger over a candle, uh, your sensory nerves are going to say hot, send that information to the brain. The brain is going to send a motor response to move your finger away from the flame. Now the autonomic nervous system, think of it as the automatic nervous system. Uh, it is in control of all your involuntary motor functions. You don't have to 
think about constricting or dilating your bronchioles to breathe. You don't have to think about constricting or dilating your pupils to see. You don't have to think about constricting or dilating your blood vessels in order to keep the pressure up in your system. You don't have to think about uh, pulsating or pushing food uh, through the GI tract. Uh, these are things that just happen automatically in response to your environment. And those are under the control of the autonomic nervous system. Uh, the digestive system provides the uh, mechanism by which food travels through the body and is digested. This pulsating movement of food through the system is known as peristalsis. And um, the digestive system includes the stomach, uh, actually includes the mouth, the teeth, um, the esophagus, the stomach. Uh, food is chewed and uh, and uh, saliva or digestive um, enzymes are added to the food as you um, swallow it. Uh, it ends up in the stomach where it stays for about three hours and is mixed with uh, gastric acid and gastric juices. And the food is further broken down and then it's passed into the small intestine, uh, which is made up of three parts, the um, uh, the ileum, the duodenum, and the judenum. Uh, and then it, uh, as it travels through those different parts of the small intestine, different digestive processes occur, uh, the digestion of amino acids, the digestive of fats, you know, those sort of things. And then as um, it gets into the large intestine, uh, which is made up of the uh, transverse colon, the descending colon, the anus, uh, in the large intestine, Further digestion occurs. Uh, the removal of water occurs. That's where we get our body water is, is through our colon. Uh, and that's also where stool is formed. Then you have accessory organs that are an important part of the digestive system as well. You've got the liver, which uh, detoxifies and, di and um, 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 filters uh, blood. Uh, and within the liver is the gallbladder, which releases bile. And bile is important for breaking down fatty acids. Uh, the pancreas secretes pancreatic fluid, uh, which is important for the breakdown of amino acids. But it also s secretes a very important fluid known as insulin. Uh, the spleen uh, is there as a filter as well, uh, and the appendix has really no purpose other than to become inflamed, infected, and have to be surgically removed. Uh, the integumentary system is your skin, and the whole purpose of the integumentary system, uh, your skin protects you from germs. Uh, uh, it helps provide water balance by um, uh, sweating. Uh, it also helps regulate your body temperature by sweating. Uh, the skin excretes oils uh, that are important to keep your skin smooth. And it also absorbs uh, traumatic force. So shock not in the form of hypoperfusion, but shock as the result of a blow. Uh, your skin will absorb a tremendous amount of uh, of uh, traumatic force before it tears. Uh, so it acts as a shock absorber. Uh, the skin is made up of several layers. you got the epidermis, epi on top of the skin. Dermis is the skin itself. And then the subcutaneous, sub referring to a below uh, cutaneous skin. So below the skin. So the epidermis is made up of several layers. And below the epidermis uh, is the uh, sensory receptors. Uh, you've got hundreds of thousands of sensory receptors uh, running under the epidermis that uh, pick up and sense, again, pressure, pleasure, pain, hot, cold, you know, those sort of things. Below the epidermis, you have the dermis, and within the dermis are your uh, sebaceous or your sweat glands, as well as your uh, erector uh pili muscles, uh, which cause your hair to stand on end, uh, or when they... Uh, close up, uh, goose pimples, uh, and then you've got your hair follicles, uh, which which grow out of um, the uh, the hair follicle, hair which grows out of the hair follicle. Uh, also within the dermis, you have capillaries and uh, you know those sort of things. Uh, below the dermis, you have the subcutaneous layer where your where your nerves, arteries, and veins run, as well as subcutaneous fat. The endocrine system is um, 
It's a very important system. Uh, it's a very complicated system of glands that secrete hormones. Uh, you've got the pineal gland located in the brain. Uh, you've got the pituitary gland located in the brain as well. Uh, the pituitary gland is the master gland. Uh, it helps regulate other uh, um Endocrine glands. The pineal gland is responsible for your circadian rhythm, uh, your sleep wake cycles. Uh, the thymus gland located in the neck, uh, is responsible for, uh, helping develop a strong immune system. Uh, the, um, thyroid gland and the parathyroid glands are uh, very important for the uh, retention and excretion of calcium. Calcium is a very important uh, electrolyte, a very important substance that you need in your body to help muscles contract. Uh, along with uh, sodium and potassium, uh, calcium, magnesium, those are all very, very important electrolytes that you must have at a, a certain amount in order for your muscles all to function properly, to include your heart. Uh, the thymus, we already said, is immune system. Then we get down into the female reproductive uh, organs where we have the ovaries. Uh, the ovaries uh, regulate female reproduction system. They help, uh, they secrete eggs or ovums, uh, as well as uh, help uh, with the secretion of female hormones like estrogen and progesterone. Uh, the adrenal glands are located atop of the kidneys. Uh, the adrenal glands uh, secrete uh, uh, epinephrine, uh, norepinephrine, uh, aldosterone, and these are all hormones that help regulate water, help regulate electrolyte, help uh, regulate blood pressure. Um, those sort of things. Uh, the pancreas uh, helps regulate your blood sugar levels by secreting not only insulin, but a chemical known as glucagon. Uh, glucagon raises blood sugar in your body, and uh, insulin lowers blood sugar in your body. And then with the male reproductive, you have the testicles, uh, which uh, regulate the um, male reproduction system by the uh, uh, production of sperm, uh, semen, and the uh, um, production of testosterone. The renal system is very important in the system as well. The renal system uh, includes your kidneys, includes your ureters, includes your bladder, and your urethra. Um, <clears throat> we know that uh, kidneys filter um, uh, blood, uh, and during the filta filtration process, uh, the kidneys help eliminate harmful substances. The kidneys help regulate sodium, potassium, and calcium levels in your body as well. Um, the kidneys help regulate uh, water levels uh, by either making urine or um, or um, not making urine, uh, as the case may be, if you need to conserve water. <clears throat> or if you need to get rid of water. Um, we know that uh, the kidneys also can produce stones, uh, kidney stones, known as renal colic. And as those stones are passed through the ureters, they cause excruciating pain. The female reproductive system includes uh, the breast, uh, where milk is produced. Uh, the uterus uh, is the site of the development of the uh, fetus. Uh, you've got fallopian tubes and ovaries. The ovaries secrete an egg. The egg is traveled into the fallopian tube, where it is fertilized and then makes its way into the um, uterus where it attaches to the uterine wall and develops into a human being. Uh, the vagina, uh, vagina is... Uh, uh, receive semen during intercourse is known as the birth canal during birth as well. Uh, and then you've got the uh, vulva, uh, which protects the uh, vaginal orifice and the uh, urinary uh, medius. Uh, or the opening to the uh, bladder. The male reproductive system, you have the testicles, again, which produce sperm and secretes testosterone. Uh, you've got the uh, epididymitis, uh, which is where, storm is sp where sperm is stored. You've got the vas deferens, which transports the sperm to the urethra and the seminal vesicles, which secrete the fluid for semen. Uh, and the prostate gland also secretes fluid for semen. And uh, the 
uh, bulbourethral gland, which also secretes fluid for semen. Uh, and then the uh, penis, of course, uh, delivers semen during uh, intercourse uh, and is a um, uh, the place where uh, urine leaves the body as well. So remember that metabolism requires a constant supply of oxygen and sugar, and the absence of either of these disrupts normal metabolism. Uh, and it's the cardiopulmonary system working together, the respiratory system, and the cardiovascular system working together that provide the oxygen at the cellular level. And that when that fails, that's when shock occurs or hypoperfusion occurs, when these organs are not receiving adequate perfusion. Uh, and we'll discuss in detail what happens when uh, you go into shock, when we hit that part in the shock chapter. Uh, the body is composed primarily of water, uh, well over, uh, I think it's well over 65% of the body is made up of water, uh, and this fluid is distributed throughout all body systems uh, through a very complex process that's regulated by the kidneys, and uh, uh, should you have any questions, again, uh, you can contact your primary instructor. Uh, 